Welcome back to the show. This is our final episode of the Karen Kingsbury Show, season one. So I am so glad you've taken this journey with us and that you've enjoyed listening to the guests and the story because I am a storyteller, but this is the first time that I have ever told my story. So thanks for taking this journey. And today I have as my last guest for season one, my son, the director of Someone Like You. Everyone's talking about him. Tyler Russell, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. This is exciting. Yeah, last week we had Sarah and Jake. Mm. And that was amazing, hearing them and just how they felt like the chemistry um, between them was something that you really helped to bring about, which is great. Wow, thank I guess that's you. what a director does. <laughs> well, they're so talented. I mean, it was so fun to have them. And yeah. I think that in the movie you can tell just how, not only how committed they were to making this film excellent, but just yeah. um, they had great chemistry. They were so fun to work with. and. They were committed. Oh my gosh. They were. They yeah. listened to you so well, which I loved. You were just in the zone and it's for sure what God has gifted you to do. But Thanks. it started <laughs> back in the beginning and I wanted to chat about that today a little bit. Just um there was a the point I remember when Jake got to the house when we first started uh, production and you looked out the window and under your breath you said, Well, there's no turning back. <laughs> and in many ways that's a good sort of title for your life that mm. you God literally gifted you and you were born to do this you were born to direct films tell stories you're an actor you're an entertainer you're a singer Hmm. you were born for that and uh, early on your dad and I might as well have looked at each other and said the same thing there's no (laughs) turning back (laughs) Um, wow Kelsey was always playing make-believe and she was always doing some form of drama or singing and so when you were born she was three and you really didn't have any choice I mean you were her built-in audience So she was always entertaining you and singing. And pretty soon, I mean, I think you were, by the time you were two, you were singing right along with her. Well, with a built-in audience, you get a built-in critic, too. So That is true. directing her (laughs) pretty early (laughs) on. You absolutely did. I can uh, remember one time we were coming home from church. We lived in Arizona because we'd moved to Arizona because uh, you had environmental asthma in L.A. So classic. It was a classic moment where we were we made like, everybody okay. move. Everybody had to move, all because of you, Tyler. So we moved uh, to Arizona, and we had had a really fun day at church. Um, it was, you know, moving to Arizona was kind of crazy because we needed to get out of L.A. We wanted to be close enough to still visit my parents and our family that were still in L.A. And so we looked at the map. We're like, well, we want Arizona's close. We can do Arizona, but. Um, we wanted it, you know, not too hot, not too cold. So we picked Cottonwood, Arizona, kind of right in the middle. Mm-hmm. And there was one high school, just one. Mingus. Mingus High School. And Dad contacted them, and they had one position open. Right. A Spanish teacher who could coach basketball. Right. I can remember our pastor at our church in L.A. saying, that's like what happened with Moses in the Red Sea. Like, you know, when, when, when God parted the Red Sea and, Mo- and let the— Israelites through. It was that big that this school, this one school in Arizona, would have that one position open Mm -hmm. that only dad could fill. That's crazy. We had that happen like throughout our lives. We've been talking about it now for for all of these 16 episodes, just the ways that God has worked in our family. And if you're looking for the miracles, they're always there. Which I think is cool. It's cool to look back and reflect on. I mean, so many times when you're in, this is like a tangent, but when you're in the middle of something it's hard to see how god's piecing it together totally and there's this huge gift of having you know the hindsight to Mm -hmm. go wow look at how god connected that and orchestrated all that to happen you know um i think that's the cool thing about reflecting and just seeing how how god really did work all those things yeah dad and i have really enjoyed the episodes that we've done because we look back and and one of the things that stands out is just how faithful your dad is and unwavering faith Mm -hmm. like i've never seen him be doubting his faith like we've Mm. had things happen we've Mm -hmm. had a lot we've talked about it on these episodes um you know my dad dying and Austin's heart defect and just like having, you know, moving up and moving because of your asthma. asthma. Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) It was a real thing. (laughs) Yeah. But through it all, your dad had unwavering faith. And what's amazing. Did you? I I did, but I needed him. Sure. I did. I felt like I, I, it was like when you say, when God spells it out that, you know, the husband is the leader of the family. We lived that out and I could take big stages and have big moments and you know write big books and have mm. a lot of the world know who I am. But the world should know, and maybe they do by now after the podcast, 
um, just how important dad was yeah. in that, that his faith kept me strong and I needed it. So but it's really fun about looking back is that now we can see that in you and we can see it in Kelsey. You know, we can see it in all of your siblings that they are owning that same faith, especially, you know, I see it so much, um, you know, in you and Austin and EJ, we obviously, you know, Sean and Josh living out of state, we don't see them as often, but with, with the faith I see in you guys, it's just been amazing to see the cycle of faith. And that's the generational blessing that comes when you have a dad that walks with God and is in the word. So Mm -hmm. that's a, that's a real gift. Yep. And I've enjoyed that yep. with this podcast, getting right. to see that and remember again how how beautiful the journey of faith is through the generations. Yeah. Um, so your early years, I can remember that time coming home from church. It had been a, a visiting pastor, and so it was kind of like a revival weekend. Mm-hmm. We went longer than usual. And now it's Sunday night. It's late, tired. We're coming home. We had the radio off, and there's... Yeah, we, it was rare. We, yeah. Nobody was singing, which was also rare. We Usually everyone's singing. And uh, from the back seat, you know, you're in your car seat. You have a pacifier in your mouth, you know, just kind of quiet. Everyone's quiet. And Kelsey, who I guess must have had a visiting Sunday school teacher, something to fire she everybody up. Service. Well, she was in Sunday school. Okay. But I have to think that whatever was going on in Sunday school had to yeah. have been also equally exciting mm-hmm. because she was just fired up. So she's sitting there quiet for a few minutes and then she looks at you and she says, Tyler, you're two. You have a pacifier in your mouth. Tyler, have you uh, decided yet where you're going to go? Heaven or hell? <laughs> and you kind of, your eyes get a little bigger, like, you know, pacifier starts to move a little bit. <laughs> you don't say anything. <clears throat> She looks at you kind of a little more concerned, and she says, Tyler, Ming, what are you doing? You mean, make up your mind. Where are you going, heaven or hell? Mm-hmm. So again, now your eyes just even bigger. Pacifier is moving faster and faster. She's really putting it on. Yeah, you're just yeah. So, like looking straight ahead, deer in the headlights, like what? And so she yeah. says, Tyler, you can't just sit there in your car seat, you know, two the years time old. Is now. <laughs> time She's is now. in her Billy Graham. <laughs> That's right. She said, you pocket. have to make up your mind. Where are you going? Heaven or hell? Yeah. So you right. take the pacifier slowly out of your mouth and you say straight at her, Disneyland. Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> you are so funny and you were so funny even back then, Disneyland. Disneyland. And of course, I love using that one. I'll tell that story right. sometimes when I talk because... The world's looking for Disneyland, and the truth is there really is only heaven or hell. But how are we going to let the world see that? Mm -hmm. And certainly one way is through storytelling. That's true. Movies like Someone Like You in theaters now, and that is the way we can tell people without making them run for option C that doesn't exist. Wow, that's true. Um, So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your growing up years. You were always leading, you know, cousin plays or singing or what? What what do you remember most about it and why? What? made you so drawn to storytelling? Hmm. Well, I think having you as a storyteller so made it. I guess it, that's true. It made, I mean, it was so accessible, <laughs> like the idea of watching you write your books or, a, you know, the copy, the manuscript would come in the mail and you'd be editing it, you know, before everything was digital. And I think just that was exciting to me, the fact that you would, that God would give you an idea and then all of a sudden, six months later, you're holding you know, the manuscript, and then six Mm. months after that, you have the book. And that's just such an exciting, the whole process was exciting to watch. And so I remember early, like in elementary school, coming up with story ideas or, you know, writing things that, whether it was on paper or like in our Microsoft Word, you know, just coming up with ideas. There was always ideas that I wanted to write or work on. or, um, And I think what was cool is that I always felt like I had a supportive audience too Mm -hmm. um sometimes it was a captive audience (laughs) like like they (laughs) literally had no choice (laughs) wherever two or more are gathered a play must break out (laughs) yeah but i think even recently we were watching home videos at some gathering i don't remember what it was but um i had printed programs and made everybody sit down and we were doing some play all the cousins were in it and the siblings were in it but the adults in the room were very engaged. You know, there was just the, in, even if it was a fake enthusiasm, you know, or like I'm sure everyone was <laughs> it wasn't. tired. Or, you were, you had us, you was gripping. But I think what was cool is that it, the environment was definitely a nurturing environment for creativity. 
mm-hmm. and we had all sorts of things we were involved in growing up. You know, everyone at one point or another did sports, or at one point or another did piano lessons or singing lessons at theater. And yeah, I think you played what soccer, football, and basketball well, we don't at talk one time. About soccer, baseball, I guess. Was soccer was. <laughs> I did. I did get the bench warmer award. You did. In soccer. That's true. Shout well, out I'll, to I'll my high school and, coach. Yeah, I'll admit that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I really, I, I enjoyed <laughs> playing sports too, and I enjoyed you know doing the artistic things. I think for me, I just continued to be drawn to, when I was younger, we would maybe, I think one of the first things we saw was like a professional production of The Wizard of Oz in Portland or something. Mm. Just that way that that story could be told in this entertaining way. And, and, and it was such a captivating form of creativity and storytelling. And so that's just what I continued to love as yeah. I was growing up. You know, we I think in fifth grade, I continued to write, but it was always, it was never just one thing for me. And it still is never just one no. thing for me. Like I wrote that, um, the American flag story. What was it called? I, I hold it, in my hand. I, oh yeah. That was the prompt. I hold in my hand, the United States flag, right? Yeah. Cause the prompt was you had to write a story. It was a, it was a writing contest a national yeah. contest or a, I don't know if it was just for Washington state, but I hold in my hand. Okay. That was the prompt. And you chose, I hold in my hand. The United the, States flag, yeah, the US American flag, flag. Yeah. and it won first place. First place. So I'm very proud of that. Yes, um, we must always remember that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it just—I think that that even as small as that was, it's just it's there's little things as you look back at God saying like, keep going in this thing, mm. you know, in writing or like mm. the first play I auditioned for with Christian Youth Theater in in Washington, I got a lead part, mm-hmm. and I I. I don't say that to say like, oh, I'm so good. I got this lead role. But I think that was God saying like, keep going in this direction. Yes. Keep going in this direction. Yeah. Um, and always just enjoyed that process, whether mm. I was being on stage or, you know, directing friends and eventually, you know, directing students or, or directing um, actors and different things as I got older. it The whole process was exciting for me and it still continues to be exciting. And I think growing up at a house that where it was safe to do that, and you had support from your parents and your siblings, even mm-hmm. if it was silly or if it was, if, you know, that was the last thing people wanted to do. I think you and dad knew that God had given me gifts and had given, you know, me and my siblings gifts. And you always just encouraged us. You encouraged us in those gifts, but also to try new things. And if we tried something new, to stick it out. Mm-hmm. Um, like if I wanted to play baseball, great you got to finish the season, you right. know, even if I hated it halfway <laughs> through or whatever it was, um, you have to finish what you started and let your yeah. yes be yes, let your no be no. And in doing things that were uncomfortable or trying something new and sticking it out, I think that that grew us mm-hmm. um, to continue just to be confident and to keep trying new things, which is why I have this belief, even as an adult, that I can do anything, you know, yeah. like that. And it really is nothing is impossible with God. Mm-hmm. But also the, the cheerleaders in your life are so important as well. Mm-hmm. And knowing that I don't have to be limited just to do one thing. Right. But that if the opportunity is there and God is opening the door and there's peace as you enter those doors, um, then go for it. And I think okay. that was such a huge, beautiful lesson um, from growing up. You know, I so appreciate you sharing that. Something that hit me is... Yes, you were in a home where obviously I was an author and you were seeing that process being ex- an exciting process. But really, it goes back to this, like for me, as I've told my story through these 16 episodes, it's a strong spiritual leader in my husband and your dad. Um, because you had, you sure, you saw how, how it was done, the way I was doing it, and how I could you know think of an idea and then write a book or tell a story on a stage or whatever it would be. But you had a dad who was a basketball coach, Mm -hmm. and he made you feel like king of the mountain, whether you were on a basketball court or on a stage, didn't matter. That, you, the fact that you had strong men in your life, and Papa, Mm -hmm. you know, my dad, your grandfather, was another one of those who would come over to the house and he would sit down at the bar on the kitchen, at the, you know, in the bar stool. And he would watch you and Kelsey sing something because you were always singing. Mm-hmm. And you'd put on some song and you would be singing and dancing to it and you had some choreography or whatever and just having the time of your life. And my dad would get tears in his eyes. Yeah. And he would look at you and Kelsey and he would say, I can't believe that God is so good that he would let me live long enough to see this. Mm-hmm. So you had people who were admiring you, yeah. seeing the talent in you that you actually really had and fostering it and cheering you on from the 
depth of his heart. That was your dad, mm-hmm. too. Totally. Um, so, yes, I encouraged you, and I cheered you on. But I think you were surrounded by men that were strong and that saw this gift in you and believed in it and breathed life into it. And what a gift that is, you know, mm-hmm. to be. And I know that you're going to be that kind of dad one day because mm-hmm. you've seen it modeled. So yeah. I think that's really special. Um, so when you were when you were in school, you continued doing, you know, different plays, different musicals or whatnot, and that went that went on through college. Yep. Uh, and you went to Lipscomb University here in Nashville. We moved here in 2011, obviously, and you started off at Liberty. I did. And you were in the choir. Yes. What was so, that like? So well, let's see. We moved here to Nashville. Yeah, in the summer of 11. Like a month after I finished high school. Right. And then about a week later, I went to Lynchburg, right. to Liberty. Right. And I I, um, I auditioned and, and was a part of a choir called LU Praise. And mm-hmm. it was a gospel choir at mm-hmm. Lipscomb. I mean, at Liberty, excuse me. Um, and we, we were a traveling gospel choir. So I was pretty much gone every weekend at some different church or yeah. in a different place. Um, with this gospel choir, amazing group of people, yeah. and really just, I think that group grew my faith a lot, just sharpened me a lot, and I studied worship there, and so it was a really, um, I didn't think I was going to continue doing it. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I think college is... That kind of sums up college, right? <laughs> I know. I think <laughs> it, I think college just presents you with this whole chaotic thought process of like, I don't really know what I want to do. I don't know if I can keep doing what I did in high school. Like right. I might, I need, now I need to be serious. Right. Now I need, so I, I studied worship and thought maybe I'll do, you know, worship or Christian music or music business. I wasn't really sure, but I was really plugged in with that choir. Yeah. And then after that year, I really felt released from my time at mm-hmm. Liberty and I, I didn't feel like I needed to stay there anymore and wanted to be near the family in Nashville. And so I transferred to Lipscomb and even in that, um, it took me about a year before I figured out that I was going to go back and do theater, but do directing for theater. So yeah. I had done a lot of performance growing up, lots mm-hmm. of roles, lots of shows, and felt like, well, if I'm, I can't get away from theater. It keeps coming back. Obviously, God is nudging me in that direction, right. and I, I wasn't sure what that looked like, but I knew if I do directing, it'll give me new skills and um Maybe I was thinking it would be it would give me hireable skills, you know. Uh, yeah, something you could actually do. Yeah, yeah. so I, I <laughs> that's a job. I got my BFA in directing, and I'm, I'm minor in musical theater performance. Mm. And so if I got to continue to perform and do great shows at school, but then also learn the side of directing that I I started to fall in love with more. Mm-hmm. I, well, I don't know if I could say more. It's it's I can't pick, you know. Yeah, but I, know. I fell in love with it in a different way. Yeah, and. Did. Um, did a lot of theater directing courses and studied that. And then we did some film directing and screenwriting as well. And that started to introduce me into that side of it. Yeah, um, so much of that now that's played a role. Like yeah. we, we co-wrote uh, the Pure Flix series, Thousand Tomorrows. Right. We co-wrote the Hallmark movie, Maggie's Christmas Miracle. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we co-wrote Someone Like You and yeah. so many others that are – in, in the process, world. that's right, in process. But I remember sitting, you know, front row, or as close as I could get, and um, doing the. Uh, I, I got permission, so I was breaking the rules, but I did get permission most of the time, most of the time, to be filming. <laughs> and I don't regret that a bit because I've got all those. I know my friends would always say, "Your mom's here. We can see her filming in the front row." You know, <laughs> that's they, exactly. They would know exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I loved it, and I loved. I watched you be, you know, Tony in West Side Story, and Marius and Les Mis, and The Cat in the Hat, and Susical. So many performances, and I, I remember thinking like. Is this going to be the end? You, I think your final one was Susical mm-hmm. for Lipscomb. And right. I was just crying. And I felt, I was crying and smiling. Cause so thankful. Like my dad would say, like Papa would say that I got to live long enough to be able right. to see you perform like that. And you're so talented, Tyler. It was so fun to watch you. Thank you. Uh, you just lit up a stage. You sing from the depths of your heart. That's a, because you're a deep person. So you bring more to every role in life in real life and in, in, in the things you do, and also when you're performing. Mm. Um, but it wasn't the end, and that's the exciting yeah. thing, is you went on to, to do, recently you did Godspell, and you got the chance to play the role of Jesus. What was that like? Yeah, well, it was amazing. Yeah. It was intimidating and um, and just a great, a great opportunity to sort of pour into those scriptures. I mean, most of what I said as Jesus in Godspell was straight from Matthew, and so I'm memorizing chunks of... Matthew, it felt like a very reverent experience, and to do a musical that combines that side of what I love to do with 
just serving the Lord and it was very mm-hmm. worshipful. Um, it was an awesome experience. And yeah. I'm, I think like definitely a, a highlight as far as performing goes, yeah. getting through that show. Definitely. And now you're on but an I improv had, team. I am. That's oh, sorry. true. I no, I, Go I was going to say, but it had, been, it had been some time since I had performed. It had. Um, we did Crusade, the Billy oh, Graham right. musical yes. here in town a few years yeah. prior to that. But I really spent time after college expanding my horizons again. You know, and I think yeah. about like we're talking about how there's no there's no turning back. And yeah. there are moments where you go, this is my chance to pursue this or to st- study this or focus on this thing. Right. And after I had spent time at in, in college doing theater, I just knew I needed to do to take a break and do something else. And I, mm-hmm. I re- wrote and recorded some music. And then yes. we started d- screenwriting, and we also wrote the Baxter books together. And mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. And that was where, as rewarding as theater is, and there's really nothing like a theatrical experience, I think being a lot in a live theater is an amazing experience, but I started to see the, um, the impact that film can have as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went up after college, went up and, and worked on the set of the bridge, the Hallmark That's movie, right. the bridge. Yep. And I was just kind of saturated with the film world and how many hands it takes to make something like that mm-hmm. come to life. And the fact that they're all working on something that lasts, you know, forever. Outlive us. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. in some ways it's like, as long as there's an opportunity to Google the bridge movie, you know, yeah. or in the, you know someone like you movie, mm-hmm. um, it'll be available. And so the intricacies of making film was really compelling. And I came back and worked on a film that we shot in Nashville. I was in the art department, and then I worked. I was a production designer on a short film, and then someone asked me to direct a music video and direct a short film. And it started to just Um, I started to gather all of these skills by being in different departments or working with different people. Mm. And I just knew that whenever God called me to it and whenever the timing was right, I so badly wanted to be a a captain of a ship, you know, uh, to to direct a film. Mm -hmm. And the way that it came out in this way was such a a beautiful, um, just the fact that we got to do it together. It was such a beautiful process and such an awesome chapter to say, you know, the first film that I get to direct, the first feature film I get to direct is one that I get to do with you. It was awesome. It's been a hard year. I fell in love with London Quinn in high school, even though she told me not to. She was in vitro, and there was another embryo. She might have a twin. Do I look like London? I can't change the past. Every time that I'm with you, I was looking at London all over again. She always wanted me to find someone like you. Karen Kingsbury's Someone Like You, now playing in theaters. For tickets, visit someonelikeyou.movie. And to think that tonight, somewhere across the United States, millions of people are going and they're going to go watch that movie. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible, it was an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. And it all began um, the summer of 22. That's right. Yeah, we were at the beach um, and big family vacation. And I was obsessed with writing the script. I usually, you write the first draft, but this time I wrote the first draft. Yep. And I couldn't stop writing. I was just so, I just would sit there on the edge of the shore and write. And right. I was just, it was just pouring out of my heart, yep. the script for someone like you. But I knew I needed your help and I needed a co writer to be able to make it stronger. Uh, you're a very good, you see movies, you see stories very well very gifted at that so whenever we work together you elevate it to it you know Mm. page after page it gets elevated but i also knew i wanted you to direct and i could almost see the terror in your eyes like (laughs) maybe it was the 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 realizing the gravity of the responsibility let's say right but i presented it to you Mm. and there were other things you could have done during that time and you were not sure you were you being asked to do some teaching at cyt at christian youth theater and different things, and you said you would pray about it. So tell me about that from your perspective. Yeah, I think it was, I think there was a little bit of fear because with the phrase no turning back, it's actually true. It like, is true. Once you say yes. Start spending money. Yeah, you can't, I mean, it It would be a whole different kind of process to change your mind or go, well, I don't, you know, I'm yeah. going to back out of it. And it certainly would not be the courageous move. And I, right. I really felt like, this was the moment you've even said at some point, like it's that swinging of the bat moment, you know? Yeah. Um, and it felt like if I say yes, that's going to mean this, this, this. I mean, there was a list of fears and, and even just wrestling with like, 
you're not you're not sure if you're ready until you do it. Right. But you have to be willing to say yes, I'll do it to yeah. prove that you're ready. Um, yeah. So I wanted to say yes, but I didn't want to say yes just to say yes, just because you had asked me and just because, you know, I, I wanted to be sure that it was a story that I felt excited about. I'm um, so proud of you that you did this. Yeah. You well, took that thanks. time. I mean, because I just think yeah. it's your first, you only get one first movie as a director. Yeah. And um, I didn't want to just do it because you asked me to, which maybe sounds silly. <laughs> no. But it was like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, I was so honored that you, I was honored and overwhelmed that you asked me. That's a really good way to Because you could it. have asked anybody and you've oh, worked with lots of great directors. Um, but I just, I, I, I sat with it. I looked at the book again, which I had, of course, read before when it came out. And Are I you just, just saying that? Or, no. no, I did. <laughs> you really did. Yeah, okay. I did. No. And uh, could you imagine? <laughs> no, I mean, but people, I mean, you are that person that loves to read. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember loving the book when it came out. And um, so I, it, it just the pieces fell into place. And I thought, I don't know how we're going to get there. But if you trust me and I trust the Lord, you know, we're going to make it happen. And it's going to be, yeah. it's going to be an adventure um, and there's no turning back, so let's go for it. And yeah. I think at that point, that was probably June of 22. It was. It was June of 22, And the 22, script wasn't right. finished yet. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, is that year, by October of 2022, we were shooting the movie. Yes. So between June and, so and October, the script got finished, a, you know, a few versions of the script. Mm-hmm. We hired a casting director. We got our... our our crew here in Nashville. On the ground producers who would help us get cast, or not cast, but the crew together. That's right. We needed 50 members of crew. I mean, yeah, just, <laughs> it was one of those things where they're really, every step of the way, it's like there's no turning back. I think even before we started shooting, you know, there was this whole conversation about, well, what if, I mean, because people are still talking about COVID. Yes, which they were at about that, then, At that yeah. point, it We still had to have a COVID supervisor. Yeah. Uh, what was it called? The... Um, Compliance, yeah. something. Yeah, com- I'm, so, I'm glad <laughs> don't we don't. I'm glad we don't remember but it. But there was this panic of Ugh. like, I remember you called me and said like, well, what if someone gets COVID and we get shut down? You know, yeah. or what? and it was like, what if? Yeah, you know, I can remember like, Natalie, can our, our producer, yeah, um, Natalie our Rufino local Wilson. producer, Natalie, uh, Natalie P- Rufina Wilson. She said to me, she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Karen, everything about making a movie is terrifying. You have no guarantees at all. Yep. You're just going to have to trust God. Right. <laughs> I thought, well, I can do that. That I can do. I've seen it modeled. Yeah, and, and I don't and think I... Donald, that... I, I don't think I realized until we were making the movie how much faith is required to make a movie. Whew. You know, like every... And we used our savings. I mean, so that put the level up at a little higher. It's not like we're using sure. some investor's money that he could afford to lose. Which I'm thinking every day I'm going, driving to set going... <laughs> I'm thinking about what is on the line financially yeah. and time-wise. And, you know, okay, you really can't mess this up because they're paying for it or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. But I do think that there was a total dependence on the Lord. Totally. Um, because it's like, well, I've never made a movie. I've also never shot a movie where people are on jet skis in the middle of the lake. Right. Or where we're at the zoo. Mm-hmm. I've never thought about shooting a movie where, you know, I can't say a spoiler, but, you know, where people, where there's an accident, right? Yeah, or something like right. that. Um, right now, some people have seen it. It's yeah, but weeks. there was just yeah. lots of hoops and hurdles. Yeah. And every day was... Um, a different challenge to just say, all right, Lord, let's just get through today. And I remember a friend told me before we started, he was like, just focus on the next shot. Mm. Like, just get the next shot and the next That's shot. It's kind of like shot. writing. Mm-hmm. Next chapter. Mm-hmm. I, I know dad and I talked about it and we said, you know, there's nothing in the coffin, right? So the, the, we're, what are, we have the savings that God has allowed mm. us to build up that if we, u- if we use someone else's money, they get to make the decisions. And we wanted a movie that was super high quality that told the story that the book told, and that was just unforgettable, mm-hmm. unforgettable, beautiful, and redemptive. And the only way it was going to happen is if we used our money. Um, you know, advisors told us not to, financial advisors and people like that, but God told us to, to do it. Mm-hmm. So I was never afraid once I got past the COVID thing. COVID was, I just did not want to have to have that restriction. But, you know, there were a lot about anything. I mean, you could have a person get sick, or you could have... Uh, weather could shut you down and you get behind in your schedule. Mm-hmm. And I, dad and I said, what if you only get, what if like the world ends like 20 days into the 25 day shoot? What are you, do, was it a good choice still? And that's where it came down to for us. Then let's make, yes, it had to be a yes. So let's make this church. Let's make mm-hmm. this ministry that every day, if it, you know, if it costs you the money to make a movie, okay, whatever, that's again, that's God's money. So it doesn't matter. But 
let's make sure it was worth it for today, just for today. Right. So I did a small, you know, a, a short devotion each morning during pre-production, which we had at our house, which I wouldn't do again. But we should have filmed that really. That we should have. Would have been a reality show. So many things. It was unbelievable. Downstairs was all the wardrobe. Yeah. So many clothes. Makeup. Um, production design. All the all the art pieces were yeah. all downstairs. Garage, you couldn't walk no. through the house. You you amazing. actually couldn't walk through the house. But um, it was amazing and it was welcoming, mm -hmm. and I loved that. I think I wouldn't do it again because I'm not sure everyone necessarily resonated with that that way that I hoped they would. Well, you know what's funny is that that's how you and Dad have always been, though. Yeah. Open and whether house. it's like a young life group or friends, like the fridge was always stocked. Help yourself. Yeah. Even if it was like. <laughs> you know, people took it, even if people took advantage of it, right? Yeah. Which people did growing yeah. up, but the generosity and the open heart and the open door policy was always there. And that was the same way with the film. It's like maybe mm -hmm. it didn't go exactly how you pictured it, but you certainly presented um, a, you presented a scenario and an experience for everybody that what's ours is yours. Yeah. And we love you, and we're here right. for you, and we're going to pray for you, and Jesus loves you. And yeah. um, no matter what, you know, nobody can leave that process and say, like, I didn't feel loved. That's I right. didn't feel seen. I didn't feel, even if it wasn't their style or even if it was not traditional, it certainly was not what, what they is, didn't believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think, you know, you completely started the whole process with this um, mindset of excellence and of saying, like, mm -hmm. even if the film doesn't get made, we're going to be, like you said, be church to people and yeah. and you feed them well. You, you know, did, just, yeah. Leading those devotions every day. Yeah. Um, so we got the pre-production with those devotions and and feeding them well, which I thought was right. a big part of it too. We had to do that, and then it was your turn. It was all you once we started filming, and you, it went from like our morning kind of devotion. You took it on then as a beginning of a day prayer, but yeah. what, how did you, how did that feel? A first day, you know, you see Jay yeah. coming, but no turning back. Sure. How did it, just how was that experience? Well, it was, it was a um, scary and exciting thing. You know, you see the actors start to come in and they're getting fitted for outfits and you're talking about the script and, and, um, and I, I just, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a moment of, here we go, you know, and yeah. I, there's really no better way to explain it because like, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't yeah. know if actors would come in with an attitude or with like this, yeah. you know, I need this, I need that, I need this. And so I just, every day was just a prayer of surrender. Yep. Of, you know, let me be open, let me be available, whatever I need to receive or give to other people today. Like, and, um, you prayed out loud with the, the yeah. So well, right. Well, once we started shooting, it was like, we decided to you know, do a prayer before we would, um, you know, I, we had talked about like, where, when should I pray or where should that go? I didn't want it to feel too forced. And, mm -hmm. but then it was just simple. It was like, well, let's just pray right before we say action on the first shot of the yeah. day. And there was of course like, well, there might not be time or people will be in a rush and, you know, we're always behind in the morning and it's going to keep. And I, I think someone on, someone was like, well, if it makes us behind on the first day, we won't do it on the second day. Like you can pray on the first day. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I just trusted the Lord. And I knew that I felt like as we were going along the shoot, he just kept saying, if you make time for me, I'll give you all the time that you need. And, you know? we, were and we did. Right we had all time. the time that we needed. I think we had one day of overtime. Yeah. Right. But I mean, like to think that we got everything done in 25 yeah. days, exactly what we needed. We right. had the exact weather we needed. Right. Yeah, it was amazing. We only had rain. Literally, the rain stopped right before we right before you would say action on the funeral or, or cemetery days. Those are the only times that we had bad weather. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted it. We were That's like, right. okay, the Lord just put a glistening of, of rain across all yeah. of these tombstones in this cemetery. Yeah, I think what's really crazy about this movie, and, and you know, people who have watched it already, my prayer and my hope is that they were moved by the story yes. and by the performances. Yes, even and tonight. If you're yeah, going tonight, right, go tomorrow. Right, and it's a beautiful movie that I'm really proud of. and. Um, I'm certainly so grateful that that is the first movie that I got to direct, you know, and yes. got to work on it with you. And um, But you can't talk about the movie without talking about the miracles that God did. Yes. And I think um, that's how I know that, like, putting in all that investment is worth it. Because I think people could argue, well, if you had all that money, why would you make a movie? Why wouldn't you give it away or do this or do that? And, of course, you know, I know that you and Dad have 
been so generous financially mm-hmm. to other people and to ministries and, and everything. But this really, um, it was ministry and it was miraculous. And yeah. I can't talk about the film without saying what God did in yeah. the process of the movie. And so I hope that it also brings him glory and continues to bring people to, um, you know, conversations about their faith or, yeah. or, or um, conversations about, you know, restoration and family or relationships and forgiveness. And mm-hmm. so I think that it was an awesome opportunity, yes, to use our gifts and to create and make something that will outlive us, which is wild to think about. But also I think it has a huge kingdom, you know, footprint yes. in culture. And, and, Great. Um, and that's an exciting thing to know that you gave it your all. And you gave it up to God and just let him do with it whatever he wants to do with it. And there's so many testimonies, so many stories about how he showed up and um, how it how it impacted people. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. It's so absolutely a, a beautiful thing. You're welcome. To look back and to to just think how God used you everywhere I looked. Because once, once we rolled cameras, I was in the background completely at Video Village and watching and just having that front row seat to watching you perform and you were performing this time as a director director, and uh you were you were directing your heart out and all of the adults Mm -hmm. like the adults who've acted for a long time i mean they're all adults but our younger leads have less experience they were so talented but the others the ones that played the roles of the parents they've done some of them acting for four decades and they said that you as a director pulled out some of the best performances they had ever given and they called you the actor's mm-hmm. director. Isn't compliment. Yeah. And I think that's that's a huge compliment. I and I care about the actors, you know. I'm yeah. I will probably be the first person to tell you like I'm not a super technical director. You know, I, I can't tell you all the names of all the lights that we used or all the, you know. But I do know what makes the story good. Yeah. And I knew that if I focused on my relationship with the actors and making sure that they trusted me and that I had their back. I, I reached out to all the actors before we started, and I just I sent them e- a few emails just about the movie, the heart of the movie, mm. and I just said, you know, I'm here for you. I have your back, and if something goes down on set that you're not happy with or that you feel upset about, I will always do my best to defend you, but can we have that conversation privately? Can we have yeah. that conversation off set? Can we? And I, it was really important for me not to – watch anybody explode on set because you hear about that happening yeah you know so and so stormed off the set or they never plan on yeah yeah but i just knew okay let's let's start this process with clear communication and let them know that i'm gonna hear them i'm gonna see them i want their input yeah you know i wasn't trying to bring in an actor only to tell them what to do and not listen to their ideas and not collaborate with them and we had such a collaborative cast yeah who they were they felt comfortable to give their input or to say well what if i did this instead or you know, I love this this outfit, but what if we brought it back in this way? And everybody, mm. I just, I love this process because it's so collaborative. And I remember I can think back on the bridge when I worked on the bridge, sitting there right out of college, and all of a sudden, you know, they'd call cut. And teams of people would come in yeah, and reset like a, a water, you know, fill up a water cup that someone had drank from, or if they were eating, you know, bringing in a new, a new plate, adjusting plates. hair, makeup, yeah. you know, doing a light. And it was all this teamwork. Um, and every job is the most important job Mm -hmm. because it all comes together. And I just wanted everybody to trust each other and to communicate well. And, and I think we accomplished that. And I I can't, I can't say enough good things about our crew. Yeah. You know, Nashville is such a growing place in film and we got so blessed to have Natalie and Kyler and Mm -hmm. Corey and Lance and Malia, Mickey, you know, all of our department heads, Krista and Monica. Yeah. You're amazing. um, Yeah. Just such That's a, what we're hearing now. I mean, the feedback we're getting, you know, that people say the excellence at every level. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, speaking of every level, like you didn't just direct. You you were a producer because you helped on every level, but also music supervisor. Sure. Um, you have a song in it. Yeah. So that's fun, right? Yes. The, go you, there. Did you hear my song? If you're listening right now, did you? <laughs> I, I was going to say like, you can't like this, but. Well, they can. Know. They can, you know, on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, you you have a song in it. Music supervisor worked with Michael W. Smith's son Tyler Smith, right. who was our composer, uh, to try to really capture the mood mm-hmm. through music. And I got to sit in on the string session. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah, absolutely beautiful. I feel like like you said, you can't talk about the movie without yeah. talking about the miracles. Right. Um, 
It reminds me of the Bible verse that we raised you and your siblings with, the whole family, we would talk about it all the time, Luke 12, 48, to whom much has been given, Mm -hmm. much will be expected. Right. How does that apply to you today? Um, I think it applies all the time in so many things. Um, And I, I, because I'm thinking about the movie, I think about as a director, you know, it's often seen as like the leadership role or like, you know, it's it's just it's a big when I think about big directors like oh that's that person was in charge of this movie, um, so there's this this idea that as a director you're given a lot you're given stewardship of the story mm-hmm. and of the actors and of the crew and the background actors, and so what is required in that space and I just felt like for the film, it was required of me to be patient mm-hmm. and to be peaceful and to serve you serve and very to serve well. sure yeah. and to be to be joyful and yeah. to really try to exemplify the fruit of the holy spirit um and i think it's probably why i love spider-man so much because i think about uncle ben he said with great power comes great responsibility nice. and it's the same you know it's yeah. like that same idea of to whom much is given much will be expected and um much much can be relative right yeah. like it doesn't always need to be a movie that you're right. in charge of of helping lead um maybe your much looks very little to someone else yeah but the expectation is that you would use it to bless other people to honor the lord yeah um to serve right. um to think of others better than yourself and i hope that i can continue to have that mindset of no matter how Little or how big the much is that I've been given, the expectation is the same. Yeah. And um, just to give more than you receive and um, to be joyful in that process, to be a servant, and to let God lead you in those yeah. things. Love that. Love that. You know, you may have some great opportunities ahead for you. You may have been given much, but I tell you that with Jesus— We've all been given much, and much will be expected. So whatever it is that God is calling you to do, if he is asking you to step out of the boat and onto the waves of the the ocean right now, take the leap. Because remember, there is no turning back once you say yes to God. That's right. That's so good. Um, You know, this podcast has been incredible. I've loved being here with you, and I've loved having um, the different guests that I've had, you, Tyler, Thanks for having me. Yeah, so So fun. Um, But I've loved being able to go back and talk about my story and to see as we've kind of gone through the episodes, the different ones, that it's like God has been building this plan for this movie for decades in our life. Mm -hmm. You know, friends that like Scott Reeves uh, we've known for so long and then him to be able to be in the movie. Right. Um, Seeing Austin in the movie. You watching you direct, having Dad praying over the set every day, Kelsey and Kyle designing elements and helping us with all the – um, incredible marketing plan that had to happen for the people to be there today in theaters. All of that. And EJ was there. And EJ mm-hmm. doing so much and on every level, like moving boxes and wires. And of course, he got his degree in cinematography. He was a filmmaker at Liberty. So God put all the pieces together and brought friends in that we knew that could love people well and be up, you know, praying on set. Uh, like George Brown, just yeah. really, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, and but, I, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I, th- I think it's such an amazing experience, and I hope, and, you know, to all of those who, all of those listening who have watched the movie, thank you for watching it. Yeah, um, so excited. And, and just thanks for being a part of it, because we really made this movie for it to be shared. Yeah, we made it for you. Yeah, and, and for people to receive the story, and um, like she said, our prayer is that you would, hear from God that there's no turning back, you know, whatever God's calling you to take the leap and know that he will catch you. Like it's, it's not, I was talking about this the other day with somebody, but it's not faith. If you know the outcome, right? There's no faith required if you know where you're going to end up. And so this idea that there's no turning back despite the unknown ahead Mm -hmm. makes it really exciting. And there's total dependence on the Lord there. Yeah. And this takes fast for me, that goes back to episode one of the Karen Mm. Kingsbury show podcast is that, You know, once I picked up uh, my first copy of the Bible and started realizing what God was saying to me, there was no turning back. And I think that was the theme throughout our entire story and our marriage and then raising you kids. Uh, You make a decision to adopt. There's no turning back. And what a great lesson for all of us. Yeah, you You make a decision to move. There's no turning back. Eyes forward. Eyes forward. Mm -hmm. Be brave. 
be courageous. Jesus is with you. Right. Um, so, yeah, this is the last episode of the Karen Kingsbury Show, um, season one. You can actually see the podcast as well by going to my YouTube page where all the episodes will live. And you can leave us a comment because we'd love to know, you know, would you like another season? Would you like us to, would you like me to chat about something else or have, you know, certain guests? Uh, let me know. Uh, I think it's uh, important to hear back from you. And you can also find me, of course, on, you know, Instagram or Facebook or TikTok. I'm new on TikTok. <laughs> I'm tech Will we young. see you doing any TikTok dances? <laughs> not probably. Oh, not. <laughs> At home. We no. don't hold the cameras <laughs> for those things. Uh, but I'm just so glad you've been with me on the journey. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing you out at the theater for someone like you. And I look forward to being with you again. Uh, Tyler, would you close us in prayer? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time. Um, thank you for just the beautiful story that you um, are telling with the days of our life. Um, I just thank you that you um, give us hindsight to look back and to reflect on your goodness and your faithfulness. Um, for those listening, God, I just pray that you would help them to do the same, that you would show them places in their life where, um, where you have been faithful, where you have showed up, where they can testify of your goodness and the miracles that you have done and the miracles that you are doing. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, for this film, for someone like you, God. We thank you for the way that it is touching hearts. Um, and we just pray that it will continue just to honor you and bring people closer to your heart um, and that it will just continue to be a blessing, Lord. For every listener, I pray that you would just speak to them about where they need to step out in faith, whether it's with a job or with relationships or um, just with... Um, dreams or visions that you're giving them, Lord, I just pray that you would give them courage to step out and to keep their eyes forward, knowing that in you and, and um, with you by, by their side, there is no turning back, and it's such an exciting way to live. So we just pray that you are blessed and honored by this time, and um, we look forward to when we can all come back together and be together again, and um, we just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.